So I think we can get started. Good afternoon, New York. Good morning, good evening to everyone who's joining us from further afar. My name is uh, Robin Geis. I'm the director of the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, UNIDIR. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event, which UNIDIR is organizing today on the margins of the first committee. And today we hope to contribute to an informed discussion on the broad nuclear challenges that we all face. Since July 2020, UNIDIR has convened a series of informal events to discuss issues pertaining to nuclear deterrence, nuclear disarmament, and strategic arms control. The dialogue brought together a small group of about 20 to 25 international experts with very different perspectives on these issues. And while they all participated in their personal capacities, the group was composed of senior level policymakers, experts, and civil society representatives. They came from across the broad spectrum of the nuclear policy world from nuclear armed states, nuclear allied states, TPNW supporting states and other non-nuclear weapon states. Having frank discussions in a closed door, not for attribution setting, allow participants from different communities to deconstruct their thinking, explore and challenge assumptions, consider failure modes, and ultimately see what they had in common to propel the conversation in a more constructive manner. We all recognize the challenges of the international security environment and the nuclear landscape in particular. States strategic perceptions, states strategic perceptions, sorry, have driven what some call a resurgent great power competition with spillover effects for regional security dilemmas. We've seen progress slowed in arms control and disarmament against the backdrop of technological developments that can be rather destabilizing. In this context, broader sustained dialogue at many different levels is urgently needed. In recent months, we've seen efforts like the US and Russia bilateral strategic stability dialogue but the challenges are great and action is needed among a greater set of stakeholders. The initiative organized by UNIDIA goes exactly in that direction. As I've said before, the dialogue is a paramount example of UNIDIA's ability to serve as a space and a platform to bring together diverse expertise and thinking about strategic concerns. I invite all participants of today's event to read the different outputs that we have produced in the course of this initiative including our nuclear dialogue series of papers. Recently, we produced a finance paper that shares a cohesive vision for moving forward by rebuilding habits of global cooperation. Our dialogue will continue beyond today's event and it will dive further into the question how we can enhance global cooperation on these issues. Today's discussion touches upon some of the salient points of this dialogue. Our panelists, will reflect on the discussions they have used on the nuclear challenges that we are facing and the actions they see as most important or ripe for pursuit today. Before we begin, I'm very pleased to welcome the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Izumi Nakamitsu, who's kindly agreed to deliver some introductory remarks to set the scene for us. Izumi kicked off the UNIDIA dialogue over a year ago and is of course ideally placed to reflect on these issues, especially as the new report from the Secretary General or Common Agenda underlines the strategic challenges that we face. Izumi, I'm now delighted to hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Robin, thank you so much. Uh, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real pleasure to be at this event, and, and I thank you very much, UNIDIA, for the invitation. Um, when Secretary General Antonio Guterres launched his disarmament agenda, uh, securing our common future in 2018, the first action to which he committed himself was to facilitate dialogue between member states through engagement in formal and informal settings in order to help member states to return to a common vision and path, leading to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Now, this project, in seeking to reconcile, if you will, uh, competing views and find, uh, and find collaborative actions 
for how to um, achieve our common goal of a world free of nuclear weapons helps um, lay the ground for such dialogue. Attainment of that shared goal requires a suite of responses, regional, bilateral, and even uh, unilateral. Uh, at the United Nations, we believe that multilateral solutions are not only possible, um, they are often the most effective way to tackle complex global problems. And they're certainly the most lasting. Now, to this end, I welcome the deep thought um, that has gone into the various collaborative actions proposed by this diverse group of experts. The recommendations for uh, reducing the risk of any use of nuclear weapons and strengthening the norm against the use of nuclear weapons should be uh, of obvious interest to NPT uh, states parties in the lead up to the 10th NPT review conference. In an environment of growing risk, they are urgently needed. The review conference remains a rare opportunity to reverse our current dangerous trajectory through the um, endorsement of risk reduction measures. I also agree that a joint reaffirmation by all NPT states parties that a nuclear war cannot be won, must not be fought, would be a useful outcome from the conference. Of course, it should go without saying that risk reduction and other near-term measures cannot, and I repeat, cannot substitute for actual steps in disarmament. Nuclear weapons remain the only weapons with the power to extinguish all lives on this planet. So any use of nuclear weapon will cause um, uh, humanitarian, really, catastrophe. For these reasons, we must approach the elimination of nuclear weapons with an appropriate sense of urgency. I believe this group's recommendation to seek common ground between the NPT and the TPNW is timely. The TPNW will play an important role in the international disarmament and non-proliferation regime, of which the NPT remains the centerpiece, of course. The context surrounding nuclear weapons has already changed markedly from the Cold War. It will continue to evolve, grappling with new challenges while dealing with existing concerns requires new thinking. And I am pleased to note that many of the topics discussed by this group related to the future of our arms control, the nexus between nuclear weapons and new domains and capabilities, revitalizing the pursuit of nuclear disarmament, building trust and confidence amongst state, are priorities for the Secretary General when it comes to disarmament. Now, in the United Nations Secretariat, we will work to implement the Secretary General's vision by inter alia developing a new agenda for peace, which will guide the organization's work in the field of peace and security, including disarmament. As Secretary General Guterres said, the agenda will need to update our vision for disarmament so as to guarantee human, national, and collective security, including through broader support for non-proliferation and the world free of nuclear weapons. In particular, through establishing stronger commitments for the non-use of nuclear weapons and a time frame for their elimination. The topics considered by UNIDIA's informal dialogue will form indeed a key part of these endeavors. So I hope that together, these efforts will help us find a cooperative way to a safer world. And I thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much, uh, Izumi, for your remarks. And uh, with this, I also look forward to, to the discussion among the panelists. And I'm going to turn it over to the moderator of today's session, Wilfred Vaughan, who is the lead researcher in the WMD program at UNIDIA. Wilfred, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Robin. I should note that this event is being recorded and will be made available on the YouTube uh, on the Unidir YouTube channel in coming days. 
So the format of today's event is a moderated conversation followed by questions and answers. I have to stress that all panelists are speaking in and participated in the dialogue in their personal capacities. So after a couple of rounds of questions from me, I'll open up the virtual floor to Q&A. To be more time efficient, I ask that you please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit written questions. I'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but we can make no guarantees as we have limited time. Now to talk about today's nuclear challenges and some of the lessons from uh, the Unidare dialogue, we have four excellent speakers who are all part of the dialogue and many of whom also contributed to some of the working papers in our nuclear dialogue series. To provide very brief introductions in alphabetical order, first we have Andre Buklitsky, who is the Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Advanced American Studies at the MGIMO University at, of the Russian Foreign Ministry and a consultant at the PIR Center. Next, we have Dr. Lewis Dunn, who is an independent consultant on the UN Advisory Board of uh, on Disarmament Matters and the former U.S. Ambassador to the NPT Review Conference, as well as the former Assistant Director of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Third, we have Ambassador Kareem Haggad, a career Egyptian diplomat with over 25 years of service and is currently serving as the Professor of Practice at the School of Global Affairs and the Director of the Middle East Studies Center at the American University in Cairo, and finally, we have Dr. Manpreet Sethi, who's a distinguished fellow at the Center for Air Power Studies, New Delhi, where she leads the project on nuclear security. Now, in our dialogue, we try to uh, keep things quite informal. So I'm going to keep that precedent and be on a first name basis with all of our panelists. I'd also want to encourage them to jump in if they have additional thoughts uh, in response to each other's answers as well. But we're going to start with the first round of questions, which has to do with kind of the state of affairs, the nuclear state of affairs and how we got here. So I'm going to turn first to Lou, actually, as one of the co-conveners of this dialogue. We focused a lot on uh, nuclear divides that exist, Lou, including among different elements of nuclear policy communities. Can you elaborate on these a bit? Um, what were some of the sources of these divides and what are some of the consequences over each over to you, Lou. Thanks, thanks, thanks Wilfred. Um, in terms of uh, the divides, I, I, would, I would focus most on the nuclear dimension. And in the nuclear and strategic dimension, I think that the three most, three most important divides, ones we focused on in the, in the, in the group, are those between the United States and Russia, the United States and China, and then India and Pakistan. And if you, if you look at these divides, I think there's a variety of, of, of sources uh, that underlie them. Uh, in part, they, there are some conflicts of interest that are clearly there. There are some differences of leadership, ambition. Uh, domestic politics plays a role. But I think one of the important elements that we focused on uh, in the dialogue was the extent to which uh, mutual uncertainties, mutual suspicions, and, and mutual lack of trust uh, play a role in worsening, feeding into, contributing, contributing to the dialogues, the, the divisions amongst these protagonists. Uh, Uncertainty, suspicions, and lack of trust about intentions, programs, activities. Now, to my mind, as the dialogue uh, stressed, uh, these divides are important uh, because of their consequences. And, and to, the, two most, the two most important consequences, I think, are a risk of confrontation, crisis, and escalation towards the nuclear threshold. Uh, because of the, in each of these divides, uh, perhaps driven by miscalculation, misunderstanding, and missteps. And the second, the second consequence of these uh, divides is, is that of accelerating arms competition and ultimately a lot of wasted resources uh, amongst these uh, countries. 
And so to my mind, in this context, I found the unit of dialogue very rewarding as an opportunity and a productive one for a group of diverse persons to come together and look at these divides, look at what was driving the divides and try to identify some ways to lessen them, some ways to reduce the risks uh, uh, that are there. So I'll stop at that point. Thanks, Lou. Before we get maybe to some of the solutions, you know, as you mentioned, the strategic environment kind of really uh, informs the uh, challenges that exist, right? And so over to Manpreet, you know, our dialogue highlighted three broad challenges in particular, consolidating non-use, recrafting arms control, and revitalizing nuclear disarmament. No small task for sure, right? Can you speak to the scope of these challenges, Manpreet? To what degree are they in intertwined or are they linked to non-nuclear factors as Lou suggested? Thank you so much, Wilfred, and hello to everyone. I have to start by saying that it's been a delightful experience to be part of this brainstorming session at DDAC. And it's an honor to be part of this panel today because I remember having great conversations with each one of you. Now, Unidir, I think, did a great job of putting together a group of thoughtful experts uh, to examine the contemporary state of nuclear affairs, which is indeed very intimidating. Uh, and for ease of analysis, the many nuclear challenges that face us today uh, are narrowed down into these three baskets uh, that Wilfred just mentioned. And the scope of each one is daunting, uh, but I'll try to give you just about a glimpse of, uh, of what these challenges are. So the first challenge is that of consolidating the non-use of nuclear weapons. And I think the high representative also uh, you know, alluded to this. I would say that only about a dozen years ago, this really was a non-issue since the perception of the possibility of use of nuclear weapons was low. The broad understanding between US and Russia on, on the fact that a nuclear war cannot be won and should not be fought had a sort of a pervasive uh, subconscious influence, I would say, on other dyads too. But the tide turned once the political relationships between the nuclear powers became more and more strained. And as each tried to sound more ominous and threatening, references to the presence of their nuclear weapons and the possibility of use of their nuclear weapons became commonplace. Uh, I think it's very recent memory that between 2017 and 2020, the language on the use of nuclear weapons became more and more casual, uh, as we saw in the case of US, Russia, North Korea, Pakistan, and even some uncharacteristic statements, I would say, by Indian political leaders. Uh, this then accentuated the perception that the nuclear taboo or the norm of non-use of nuclear weapons is framed. Uh, and it was further accentuated when the US nuclear posture review evoked the idea of a limited nuclear war as a way of signaling deterrence. Now thinking of nuclear weapons as usable in small doses is a rather dangerous thought since there can be no one interpretation of what is limited and how do you guarantee that it would remain limited? So before more nations get enticed by the idea of limited nuclear war, which could well happen since the you know, public memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is today faded. And there is greater faith in technologically being able to craft micro nukes, which can be delivered with a high amount of precision. Uh, and therefore it's possible to do limited nuclear war. Now I find this extremely, you know, a, a very dangerous idea. Uh, the world cannot afford such a thought and our uh, deliberations uh, therefore focused on the idea of why the need for consolidating non-use of nuclear weapons. The second focus was on recrafting nuclear arms control. Again, a huge challenge, and not just because countries which were earlier party to these uh, arms control are abandoning them, which they are with abandon, but because the nuclear dynamics has substantially changed from you know, the time when these arms control treaties were first crafted. So we see today, uh, multiple nuclear actors, not just two. Uh, understanding of these nuclear actors of how deterrence works is very different. We see multiple nuclear capabilities that are infringing on nuclear deterrence. BMD is just one of them, but there are also highly improved, accurate, quicker, maneuverable, autonomous delivery systems, and the development and deployment of dual use systems that blurs the lines between conventional and nuclear, something which we hadn't seen in the past. 
So nuclear arms control in such an environment will require a new approach. Uh, during our deliberations, many of us even considered whether the nomenclature of arms control needs to be changed because it seems to carry a baggage of the past and modern engagement on nuclear risk reduction or arms control uh, will have to be very different. It, it will not be about ceilings or you know, uh, capping on numbers, but uh, look at many other dimensions because all countries, nuclear weapon states seem to be sitting at different perches of capability and uh, you know, it, the, the parity is not there. The third and final challenge is revitalizing nuclear disarmament. Now getting to a world free of nuclear weapons is the ultimate way of reducing nuclear risks. But the problem lies in how to get there, especially taking everyone along. Uh, because as I've always maintained, how we get to zero is going to be as important as getting to zero. Uh, the idea then is to start with steps that make nuclear weapons more and more valueless. Uh, so encourage doctrines that strip nuclear weapons of a role except for deterring nuclear use. Uh, doctrines that constrict the employment options to retaliation only, getting nations to pledge to not being the first user of nuclear weapons. And as the weapons then fall into disuse, they will lose their national security strategy, uh, you know, uh, importance as happened with the chemical weapons. Uh, and then it would be possible to eliminate them. So to sum up, the scope of the three challenges is large, and they're certainly more linked with non-nuclear factors today than they were in the past. So we need to realize the enormity of this challenge before we can get to the answers. And that's what the dialogue, I think, uh, very effectively tried to do. I'll stop here, Wilfred, thanks. Thank you so much, Manpreet, for really underlining, as you call it, the enormity of the challenge. Um, I'm going to turn to Kareem, and I have a question, which is that you know, policy stance, uh, policymakers' stances on some of these issues um, and also, as Manpreet suggested, on how to address some of these challenges can appear quite intractable. From your experience, what's the value of dialogue when mistrust seems to run so deep and the sensitivities to these kind of issues are so acute? Yeah, thank you, Wilfred. Uh, let me just start by echoing uh, what the previous panelists mentioned. In the, in the, the I thought this was a uh, uh, the depth of the discussion uh, in this dialogue and the seriousness of the dialogue. I think really contributed to advancing the discussion on the new nuclear challenges uh, th that we face. Um, so my thanks to Unidir and and uh, uh, and to those who organized the dialogue. I think to your question, the, the purpose of dialogue is not necessarily to produce any immediate policy change, because of course, you're, you're right, policymakers will not change positions easily on these sensitive security issues related to nuclear weapons. The real value of dialogue, however, is to get policymakers to begin to think differently about these issues rather than uh, affect an immediate change uh, in policy. So uh, as was mentioned, I think the fundamental premise and the, the real point of departure of the report is that the nuclear landscape is changing and changing in profound ways. And that requires different modes of thinking about the challenges facing deterrence, disarmament, and, and strategic arms control both from a conceptual point of view, a, a policy point of view, and also a strategy uh, point of view. Two particular points that were highlighted in the dialogue and reflected uh, in the report, I, I think are uh, important uh, to mention. First, of course, th there is this interaction between emerging technologies, especially in the cyber realm, artificial intelligence, new nuclear doctrines of limited nuclear use, as was mentioned by Manpreet, new systems such as advanced conventional weapons, hypersonic strike systems, all of these elements are coming together in ways that could potentially undermine existing deterrence relationships and therefore, of course, weaken the norm uh, of non-use. I think the key point here is that the interaction between these elements is taking place in ways that we don't fully yet understand. So notions that were once familiar to us, uh, strategic stability, nuclear risk, deterrence, 
What do these mean in the, in the context of this new emerging nuclear landscape? So many of these concepts have to be rethought. And that in itself makes the imperative of dialogue much more urgent. Because here the function of dialogue is to develop a much deeper appreciation of how these interactions are changing threat perceptions, strategic concerns, not only of nuclear weapon states, but also non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear armed states outside of the framework uh, of the NPT. So we need dialogue to really reach a deeper level of understanding and appreciation. I think the second key aspect related to dialogue is the recognition on the part of the participants that the challenges of arms control, nuclear deterrence and disarmament really needs to be a collective effort. And these challenges cannot be met by any one group alone, even though of course, nuclear weapon states may carry a larger burden of the responsibility, but that responsibility is not exclusively uh, does not exclusively fall on nuclear weapon states. I think in particular, of course, the, the, the continued dialogue between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states uh, is critical. I think that the report made a very uh, important uh, mention of the need for dialogue between opponents and supporters of the TPNW, particularly important given that the TPNW has emerged as a major new factor on the nuclear, uh, uh, global nuclear uh, non-proliferation framework. And both sides should acknowledge uh, the support for the ultimate objectives of a world free of nuclear weapons, but also examine in a much deeper way how the processes of disarmament and verification envisioned in the TPNW can contribute positively to the linkages uh, between uh, the TPNW and the objectives of non-use, reinforcing non-use, and also enhancing strategic arms control. So with that, back to you, Wilfred. Thank you, Kareem. I, I mean, I think, yeah, I wanna underline your point about uh, this dialogue, um, finding the common interests that exist across these different communities, despite some of the divides that exist. I want to latch on to your point about um, thinking differently about these issues, and I'm going to turn over to Andre. Um, Robin, in his remarks up top, referred to the strategic stability talks between Russia and the US, and certainly that's gotten a lot of attention in the news recently. Um, in your view, is this a turning point in the relations between these two states? Uh, what needs to happen for this kind of dialogue or really any other like it to turn into something sustainable or to get to a point eventually where there are concrete deliverables? Andre, over to you. Thanks, Wilfred. And I would like to thank Unidir for organizing this outstanding, uh, very rich indeed dialogue and for inviting me to speak at this first committee side event. I wouldn't say that this is a turning point in uh, Russian-US arms control dialogue. Uh, this dialogue, as well as Russian-US relationship uh, through the history had its ups and downs. Uh, in the past, it used to be a cyclical process. So after the bad state of affairs in the second part of Obama administration and terrible state of affairs under the Trump presidency, it would make sense uh, to have constructive engagement, but that's not a given. I think what makes this moment very peculiar uh, currently is that it seems that we are running of, out of time. Uh, and I give you some examples. So the New START Treaty is ending in 2026 uh, without the possibility of extension. That's one thing. Second, uh, ground launched INF range systems are being produced by a number of countries and they will be deployed at some point in the future. So here's another clock for you. Then everyone seems to be working on space offense and defense. And you know, if you don't change the course, someone will deploy weapons in space or test space weapons, which again would be a sort of uh, thing which will be hard to roll back. Next thing, missile defense capabilities are growing they will continue to grow. And at some point, there'll be a level where they'll be really uh, difficult to regulate. So with all of those uh, things 
happening at the same time, I hope this will be enough for the countries to pursue arms control with you know, genuine interest and some feeling of urgency. Um, this doesn't seem like much, but we couldn't get this attitude for a while. Mm, and yet another time clock is that it's been almost a year since Biden was elected president in the United States. Uh, you know, his term is limited. There is no guarantee that the next US administration will be as much interested in arms control as this one is. Um, so, you know, uh, it really seems that uh, Russia and the United States are now interested to have sustainable dialogue and to produce concrete deliverables because if they don't, some of those things will just run their course and we'll be getting in a world which is even more messed up and even more complicated and even more uh, hard to navigate. So I, I really hope that uh, we in an expert community and our colleagues in the government would just do whatever possible to, to solve or deal with some of those issues. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Andre. You're describing really quite a tight window for moving forward and to underline kind of the, the urgency of acting on the matter. Um, so we're going to go to a second round of questions about ways forward and build on that a bit. Um, but before I do that, I do want to encourage those in the audience to submit questions in the Q&A. We're going to get to these uh, quite shortly. Um, but speaking about ways forward, and, and Lou, I'm going to turn back to you. Um, the findings paper highlights the NPT review conference as one of these windows of opportunity. And earlier, the high representative talked about something that might be feasible there. Uh, what do you think is achievable in that context, and, and what should states prioritize? Thank you, Wilfred. Um, and as we as we go into the NPT review conference, uh, what I've been struck by in a variety of recent conversations is, is the extent to which there seems to be uh, a growing interest on the part of diverse countries on trying to use the review conference to identify some practical and achievable activities that could be pursued, achieved between the review conference, assuming it takes place in January and, and 2025. And to, whether or not we're able to achieve a consensus final document, which I think is the goal, we should be trying to identify some practical and achievable outcomes. Now, what, what fits into that basket? Well, if I come back to uh, Izumi's point and Manpreet's point about the risk of use of nuclear weapons, I think that at a limit, the least that can be done would be to have all five of the NPT nuclear weapon states, and I think they're going to do this, reaffirm the Reagan-Gorbachev principle that a nuclear war cannot be won and must not be fought. But to my mind, that's not, that's not enough. I think what you can do at the review conference is to reach an agreement and get a consensus, including on the part of the five NPT nuclear weapon states, not simply that they're going to make this declaration, but that they will make a commitment to take action to implement that declaration. There clearly are a variety of things that the five NPT nuclear weapon states either together or bilaterally or unilaterally can do to show that the Reagan-Gorbachev principle is impacting their policy. To take one, one simple example, for the United States and Russia, it would be possible to resume military to military cooperation and thus to use that to try to reduce the risk of some sort of crisis, confrontation, conflict because of unintended consequences. So, I think the review conference is an opportunity to gain the agreement of the five NPT nuclear weapon states. Gee, yes, it's really nice. You've just reaffirmed Reagan Gorbachev in your statement before this conference. Well, what are you going to do to implement this 
And not only that, tell us, come back to us at the 2023 Preparatory Committee meeting and tell us what you have done to implement Reagan Gorbachev in terms of specifics, United States and Russia, United States and China. Second thing, I think as, as Andre suggested, it is a turning point at this point with regard to the United States and, and Russia, but I would also argue with regard to the United States and China. And the question is, in these two relationships, will we now go into unfettered strategic co competition with all the risks that that brings? The review conference is an opportunity, it seems to me, to use the conference to get the agreement of the United States and Russia and the United States and China on the importance of strategic dialogue aimed at mutual restraint. You have to phrase this differently. In the case of the United States and Russia, it's a commitment to move forward with arms control, to produce an agreement dealing with some of these issues before 2025. Second, in the case of the United States and China, the Chinese don't do arms control. So it's the case of getting an agreement through the review conference process that China and the United States will engage each other at the official level in strategic dialogue. And then at the official level, they will reach some agreements, take some actions. It won't be arms control, but it'll be ways to restrain their strategic competition and reduce the risk of conflict between them. So to my mind, the review conference is a great opportunity to work the risk reduction issue in terms of what's gonna happen after this declaration on Reagan Gorbachev and to work the arms control mutual reassurance competition dimension because it's an opportunity, it's a, it's a forcing event to get the key nuclear weapon states to commit. That's more long. That's longer than I should have. I apologize. I'll stop. Not at all, Lou. Um, thanks for that. And and I would certainly say uh, I've seen a lot of constructive dialogue on the issue of risk reduction uh, in this review cycle, uh, not just among the P5, but for instance with the Stockholm Initiative and the CEND and things like this. But I, I want to actually maybe put Andre a little bit on the spot before we continue, since um, Lou brought up this idea of uh, the US-Russia dialogue having an impact on US-China potentially. Do you think these kind of dialogues have these uh, signaling effects that, that Lou is talking about, Andre? Well, they, they definitely do. And uh, it's clear for the moment that uh, Russia is not um, not willing to push China to join uh, nuclear arms control as long as China doesn't want to do it on its own. Uh, but then at the same time, everybody who's paying attention understands that if China-US relationship are going as they go, if there's an arms control between US and China, it would not be possible to continue Russian US track uh, without being interfered. If you know US is racing to bring new missiles to fight China, Russia would also have to consider them since you know the globe is limited in space and those missiles fly uh, quite long distances. So I, I would totally agree with uh, Lou's approach, and I would add that. You know, getting better relationship strategic wise between China and the United States would also be beneficial for um, US Russian relationship because, as I said, it, it's hard to see how those would not be impacted. Thanks for that, Andre. I mean, I think you're speaking to kind of how these relationships can be quite entangled. And, and Manpreet, that is a nice segue to you who, who, who has written about some of these strategic chains that exist. Um, but my question would be, you know, some of these challenges, they're not just restricted to the NPT uh, states, to the NPT nuclear weapon states, or even to nuclear armed states. How do we expand the conversation uh, about addressing these nuclear challenges in a viable manner? Thanks, Wilfred. Um, but before I get to your question, I wanted to just, uh, you know, one, uh, I hope the 
state parties to the NPT would listen to what Lewis is saying because I think it makes so much sense uh, as to what can be achieved at that uh, you know platform which is appearing pretty early in our calendar now. Uh, and uh, to emphasize what Andre said about dialogue having a signaling effect, I think it does. It changes the atmospherics for all the dyads, not just uh, U.S., Russia, U.S., China, but uh, it could uh, change, uh, you know, the atmosphere in which we are going to be looking at these dyads. And uh, as long as the dialogue is happening in a listening mode where you're not talking past each other, but you're listening to the concerns of the other and, uh, you know, uh, understanding what needs to be done at your end. Um, but to get to your question now, Wilfred, it's not an easy question to answer. And I say this for two reasons. Uh, one, because while on the one hand, we do need to expand the conversation, uh, the nuclear challenges are not restricted to the NPT nuclear weapon states. I would say not even to all the nuclear armed states, if we consider nine of them. Uh, but to expand it too much also makes the conversation unwieldy. So while everyone has a stake in a world which is safe from the possibilities of use of nuclear weapons, where nuclear risks are minimized, if not obviated, uh, at the same time, I often wonder whether expanding the conversation too much might not make it unproductive. And I want to explain this with the example of the ban treaty, you know, the treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons. It started from the thought that humanitarian consequences of use of nuclear weapons affect us all. Uh, large conferences were held as part of the humanitarian initiative. And then it went to the UN General Assembly with the thought that this is a conversation that all need to be engaged with. But what then happened was that the nuclear weapon states, the nations that have to be the real doers on this front, distanced themselves from that platform because it was seen to be in an unwieldy format uh, that works on the basis of majority, not consensus, uh, where they could not explain the logic of their nuclear deterrence, uh, overwhelmed by the numbers which were not in favor of that logic. And we have to understand that there is a logic of deterrence that cannot be dismissed so easily. So the more the non-nuclear weapon states become dismissive or critical of this, uh, the greater you find the nuclear weapon states, you know, clinging onto that uh, uh, idea of deterrence. So therefore, I'm wondering whether it might not be better to keep the conversation confined to the actual possessors of nuclear weapons, uh, NPT member states or not, uh, because they are the ones who have to commit themselves to action. Of course, the pressure that is built up by the larger community is important. But we've seen the limits of what that alone can achieve on the nuclear weapon states with the ban treaty. So therefore, um, I would say it becomes necessary to find platforms, bilateral, trilateral, multilateral, inclusive of all nine, if possible, where some real conversation uh, amongst them can take place. Uh, for some time now, and I, uh, I've also you know, brought this up at the dialogue, I've toyed with the idea of the nuclear risk reduction summit process. Uh, much like the nuclear security summit process, which was initiated by President Obama, where nations were made to understand the risk of nuclear terrorism, the need for nuclear security, and hence that of national responsibility against some international benchmarks. I think a repeat of such a process, uh, preferably initiated by President Biden, to get all of the nine nuclear armed states to understand the growing risk of nuclear use, especially of the inadvertent variety, the need for risk reduction and hence national action against a set of international commitments would be helpful. Uh, even if this starts with political pledges, which are not uh, you know, verifiable at this moment in time, that itself I think could be a constructive set. Uh, so while the nuclear challenges are not restricted to the P5, not even to the nuclear armed states, the conversation has to be primarily amongst them, uh, suitably encouraged and supported by the others. Uh, but to take it to a larger format uh, might not be very effective as we've seen in recent times. Thank you, Manpreet. And perhaps it also speaks to the need for simultaneous actions in different venues to address the different dimensions of this challenge as well. Um, you know, when we talk about risk, uh, and, and many of the panelists have, for instance, talked about emerging technologies being concerned. Uh, but um, it's also hard to disassociate nuclear risk and nuclear issues from some of these regional and sub-regional security conditions and developments. Um, so turning back to Kareem, what practical steps can or should states prioritize at those levels on these issues that can also help to reduce nuclear 
dangers while these other conversations are going on. Yeah, thank you, Wilfred. Uh, so yes, I mean, in, in the context of this uh, new and emerging uh, nuclear landscape, we do find that many of the challenges associated with revitalizing strategic arms control, uh, nuclear disarmament, deterrence, th these challenges are increasingly linked uh, with the regional level. So we have these complex linkages between the global and the regional. And of course, we, we, the Manfred has uh, operated on this through, uh, I think, the very useful concept of strategic chains. And we see this, for example, with respect to South Asia, for, uh, for instance. So if we are to revitalize strategic arms control by integrating China into this process, that of course has implications on the nuclear balance between China and India. And that in turn brings in the issue of Pakistan. Similarly, if we look at Northeast Asia, so the system of US extended deterrence with respect to its allies, such as Japan, South Korea, that in and of itself is increasingly linked to the challenge, the nuclear challenge on the Korean uh, peninsula. And that of course, again, touches on uh, the issue of uh, integrating China uh, into these uh, arms control processes. So in both South Asia and Northeast Asia, we have to confront the challenge of these strategic chains linking the global to the regional. In, in the Middle East, we have a different situation in which the lack of progress on establishing a WMD free zone has really affected the legitimacy of the NPT, given that the goal of establishing the zone was an integral part of the 1995 decision on indefinite extension uh, uh, of the treaty. And of course, how we address the, the issue of the Middle East in the context of the NPT review process has been one of many contentious issues that has really undermined uh, reaching a successful outcome of uh, NPT review conferences. Um, so hopefully that will be positively addressed. So the good news is that there are processes in place for these situations that either need to be supported or perhaps revitalized. So the six party talks uh, for North Korea, and that was mentioned in uh, the report. In South Asia, we have a long history of attempts at instituting confidence building measures and nuclear confidence building measures that perhaps need to be uh, revitalized. For the Middle East, we have a major opportunity now in the form of the new UN process uh, that, that is mandated with reaching a legally binding treaty, establishing a WMD free zone uh, in the Middle East. And here for the first time, we have a forum in which the substantive issues, the, the, the complex technical issues, legal issues, political issues related to the zone are being seriously uh, discussed among uh, countries in the region. Uh, just a final thought on this issue of the regional context. I think all of this, of course, is important for the issues we were addressing here, uh, disarmament, strategic arms control, and so on. But they're also important for completing or filling in the gaps uh, of the global nuclear non-proliferation regime. So we have to address the Middle East, South Asia, Northeast Asia, if we're going to get to uh, bringing the CTBT into force. We have to address these regional contexts if we are to negotiate a fissile material treaty. So these contexts are becoming much more important to address in order to enhance the overall global nuclear non-proliferation regime as a whole. Thank you, Kareem. And, and I think you're really speaking to the intertwined nature of some of these issues, both in and outside of the nuclear space as well. Um, I see there was, you mentioned confidence building measures in a couple of regions, and I see in our Q&A, we have a question about that. So I will draw on that in a moment. Um, but before we get to the Q&A, um, I, I wanna turn back to Andre uh, for a final question. Um, We've talked in the dialogue about the bridging role that strategic arms control can play uh, as one of these three challenges, right? Both in terms of its relation in reducing nuclear risk and in enabling nuclear disarmament. 
So what does it mean to recraft arms control for the strategic environment? Um, what does it look like? And I realize this is a huge question, but I've been throwing huge questions at all of you so far. So, so I'll let you take a stab at that, Andre. Thanks, Wilfred. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a million dollar question. I think um, one of the problems, uh, so to say, with arms control that we had for a while now, it was the arms control, which is basically between Russia and the United States, at least the nuclear one, we, we don't have much other examples, uh, has been on sort of autopilot uh, for a while now. It covered only very specific systems, uh, which was leaving lots of concerns outside of arms control regulations. Uh, but we knew how to do this strategic arms control, and it was still important. And uh, that's what we're, we were pursuing. Even though as one treaty was falling after the other, uh, the number of unaddressed concerns was skyrocketing. Uh, as uh, so little is left from the arms control architecture, it is clear now that to get to something, you would need to look at a broader picture, to look at how things are interconnected, to how they affect each other. Um, so, and there is often this, you know, question of what systems are destabilizing, what are stabilizing, what is good, what is bad. You know, you, you have full conferences, full panels discussing those very issues. I don't think that's very helpful. I think if we gonna move anywhere with arms control, the starting point uh, would have to be uh, to accept the existence and to try to address the issues and systems which the other side believes are destabilizing. Now, if the, side, the other side believes that destabilizing is destabilizing, is your problem as well. You can, you know, just ignore it or say that no those systems are, are good well you can but we've been doing this for a while it's it's not leading us anywhere obviously and uh, you know this this is uh, something i guess relevant for all of the things we've been talking about because in the end the only way to achieve arms control risk reduction disarmament is to deal with the reasons which led to development of certain capabilities in the first place um, so I hope that that would be something that Russia and the United States will be pursuing, but also in any sorts of uh, dialogues, uh, people would be able to put, you know, all of the concerns on the table and then see how those are connected and then maybe look into how you can deal with them. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe disagreeing slightly with a little bit of what Manfred said that only nuclear weapon states uh, can uh, or should be involved in those kind of things. I, I would uh, politely disagree because sometimes nuclear weapon states get nuclear weapons uh, because you know conventional capabilities. So if you take, for example, DPRK, uh, for them, I would imagine conventional capabilities of South Korea or Japan would be very much on the table because you know if you take out nuclear weapons, then South Korea can easily uh, overwhelm uh, then North Korea. And uh, if you don't discuss conventional capabilities, probably again, uh, if the country believes it's their huge security concern, that's, that's not uh, leading you uh, that much. So uh, if, if this would be the approach the countries are taking, and I hope it will be, then the new arms control for this new strategic environment would probably have more agreement covering different things, some of them, could be not legally binding, just you know, political agreements. Uh, some of them could be multilateral, uh, including uh, you know some of the relevant parties, but not the others. Um, so it probably will be uh, much more complicated uh, than the current one. But since we only have one treaty left, it, it's very simple, and I would probably want it to be more complicated than that. Thank you, Andre, and I think. You know, I think your response also brings us a bit full circle to the value of these dialogues to to lay these concerns and discuss through them as well. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn to the Q&A. We've got a couple of submissions, and I continue to encourage those in the audience to submit uh, through the Q&A function at the bottom of their Zoom applications. Um, I'm going to start with 
a couple of questions about the P5. Um, one has to do with, uh, and Lou, I think you started talking about this, but one of the recommendations is for the P5 to reach agreement on and publicly announce risk reduction actions they can undertake now. Um, we listed a few in the paper, but what others do you think should they, they be able to agree on between now and the next PrepCon? Maybe I'll start with Lou and then we'll uh, open the floor for the other panelists if they wanted to step in. Lou, back to you. Thank you, Wilfred. Um, in terms of other measures, aside from what's used in the paper as examples, um, to my mind, the, the most important initial step right now, not between now and the prep plan, but right now would be the, for the P5 to create an expert working group on risk reduction. This is an idea that has been tossed around in a variety of formats uh, uh, for a couple of years now. And, and, and sometimes there's a, a tendency to uh, look at the notion of a, of a P5 experts group on risk reduction as, uh, well, gee whiz, that's another you know, experts group. But I think what we shouldn't underestimate the importance of getting the P5 experts. And by that, I mean, not just the diplomats, uh, but the military, the defense officials into the P5 process to talk to each other about possible sources of miscalculation and missteps that could drive escalation. Actions that one of the P5 might think are just showing resolve, but the other P5 think of it as, as very, very dangerous. And that type of discussion is important because maybe it will lead to specific actions in agreements, but it also may just plain lead to unilateral actions by the the different P5 countries on restraint. They don't do things that they might otherwise have done because they now understand it's going to look very, very different in a different capital. Second, I think if I had to say what other measures, crisis communication comes up uh, to, be, to be sure that the crisis communication mechanisms that we have are adequate for the task. Um, no autonomous nuclear decision-making. Uh, we're about to go into the world of artificial intelligence and the thought of, of artificial intelligence making decisions about the use of nuclear weapons is something that ought to you know, strike terror in all of our hearts. There always needs to be a person in the loop. The final one I think is a measure that the P5 might explore amongst themselves and then uh, try to reach agreement on would be no launch on warning postures. This is an important, I think, step. It's a step for the United States and Russia. It would be a step back uh, to the extent that they have any sort of launch on warning posture. For the Chinese, it would be something that they would not do. But so those, I think, are, are some other measures. But the most important thing is to get serious discussion going. And the P5 process offers a venue for that. I'd like to do it bilaterally, US and Russia. I'd like to do it bilaterally, US and China. But in the P5, they ought to be doing this. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't poo-poo the value of this type of discussion. Thanks, Lou. Andre, you wanted to weigh in here? Yeah, just uh, one brief point. So we already have a number of uh, P5 formats which uh, are ongoing, and one of them is a dialogue on doctrines. So we were supposed to get this side event on doctrines at the review conference in 2020 which frankly was, uh, I, I wasn't sure if it would be a huge success because there was such a huge animosity uh, between the P5, in, inside the P5 countries that this doctrine discussion uh, could have turned in just, you know, a, a fighting uh, in, instead of uh, uh, supporting the, the, the dialogue uh, between the P5. Now it's slightly better, I would say. Of course, there is an issue what exactly U.S. will be presenting if they don't still have their doctrines in place, but I guess they'll, they'll figure something out. So just bringing this together and having a joint P5 event on doctrines and maybe briefing non-nuclear states on what was done and how they discussed doctrines and what lessons have been learned 
that would be great to, to have, and I really hope it will be finalized for the uh, review conference. Thanks, Andre. Kareem, please. Yeah, ju just to take that thought uh, one step further, I, I think uh, th there, there needs to be um, pressure on the P5 to link all of these dialogues to their Article 6 commitments uh, within the NPT. So I think it is incumbent on the P5 to explain to the non-nuclear weapon states in the context of the, the review process, how these dialogues on risk reduction, strategic arms control, strategic stability, how these advance uh, the objectives of nuclear disarmament and specifically uh, how they translate into specific measures for uh, nuclear reductions. And I think that in and of itself will be an important confidence enhancing measure uh, that, that reinforces uh, the commitment, the political commitments uh, relating to their Article 6 obligations. Thank you for that, uh, Kareem. Uh, Mampri, did you have any thoughts on this one? Yes, just very briefly. Um, uh, in case that uh, you know dialogue on doctrines does happen, I'd like to recommend uh, you know three kinds of restraints that need to be explored uh, to add to you know what Lewis was mentioning. One is restraint on the role of nuclear weapons. So uh, you know bringing them back to just nuclear deterrence instead of talking about use of nuclear weapons against you know, large scale conventional attacks, cyber, space, chemical, biological, the more we expand the role of the weapon, the greater is the, you know, the problem that comes in. Secondly, restraint on the number of contingencies in which the weapon can be used. And if we can bring it down to retaliation only, that itself becomes a good uh, sort of move. And thirdly, I'd support what Louis said, Lou said about uh, restraint on the force posture. So formalizing the low alert levels, I think, uh, is a great idea uh, to get us uh, you know, moving in that direction. Thanks, Manpreet, and thanks to all of you for being so kind of precise about these particular actions that can be taken. Um, I'm actually going to ask a question linked to this emerging technology uh, aspect, as it has come up quite a bit um, throughout the discussion already. And, you know, there there. Uh, exists an increasingly multi-dimensional or multi-domain aspect of this challenge, um, of, of these nuclear challenges with developments in cyber and space and just kind of in general, these new systems. Um, can you perhaps project the future of nuclear challenges? And uh, perhaps more precisely, how do we start thinking about uh, tomorrow's dangers and how to address them in the context of uh, the structure that we have today. Would anybody like to take a shot at that one? Andre, please go ahead. Yeah, if I may, um, I'll probably be contrarian uh, here and probably this is not uh, something <laughs> you were referring to specifically, uh, but you know, when we start talking about how do we uh, regulate this new technology and how do we uh, make sure that this new stuff is uh, included. It's not like we are very good at regulating the old technologies and, you know, making sure that the old style stuff is covered. Uh, so as I was alluding, we like space is not regulated, missile defense, intermediate range systems, like you name it. Uh, so in that sense, yes, we have to think about what uh, you know, uh, specific new technologies like hypersonic are adding to existing problems, but actually they are just putting on top of the fact that we already can shoot each other with uh, nuclear tipped missiles. Well, some of them will be hypersonics. Some already have been hypersonics as all ACBMs are and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, I really love to not to get uh, too carried with these new technologies and forget that we still, the majority of our nuclear weapons pointed at each other are, are very old technology, but still, you know, an issue. Thanks, Andre. I guess that's somewhat of a glass half empty perspective perhaps, um, but, but point taken. Um, Luke, go ahead, please. I, I, I think Andre's point about, we haven't done so well at regulating the old technologies is well taken. Um, it seems to me that the start to regulating the new technologies, and most importantly, the ways in which the new technologies 
spill into the old technologies, a point that some of my panelists have made that, come, that was made in the dialogue. The, the start is to have some type of a serious and sustained dialogue. A dialogue, uh, to my mind, ideally between the United States and Russia and the United States and China as to how these new technologies are going to spill over and impact deterrence relationships in ways that are potentially dangerous. So that's, that's the start. So that I don't think you need a, a quote unquote new structure. I think you have to somehow get the, get the old structure, which was dialogue amongst nuclear weapon states bilaterally working with more bilateral dialogues. You can use the P5 a little bit as well. Um, but let's start to talk to each other first. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Manpreet, Kareem, did you want to uh, weigh in on this question? Kareem, uh, maybe please. just a, uh, so a final thought, perhaps, on this. I mean, in addition to dialogue, because I, I think, as I mentioned in my previous remarks, yes, I mean, th these things are interacting in ways we, we just don't yet uh, understand. And so dialogue is important to, to arrive at, at this, this deeper understanding. But I'm, I'm wondering also if, if there might be room for these, uh, these issues to be integrated at, at the declaratory level, uh, specifically uh, in terms of official nuclear postures. So uh, it, it may be uh, constructive for nuclear weapon states to explain in their declarations how they think these things uh, impact issues of strategic stability, issues of risk and risk uh, reduction, uh, issues of deterrence. Uh, and, and that might create a baseline uh, by which we can begin to assess the very complex linkages between these technologies uh, and new systems. Thank you, Kareem. The next question I want to ask actually draws upon all of your personal kind of uh, thoughts uh, and, and, and experiences, as all of you have quite extensive experiences in the field of nuclear policy and in the discussion around uh, nuclear challenges. Can you reflect individually upon where we are in this current environment? Um, how does it seem through your eyes? Um, Lou, perhaps starting with you? I think we're actually at uh, a turning point, a turning point uh, in that either we're going to see uh, in the US-Russia strategic relationship and the US-China strategic relationship, the two that I most focus on, we're either going to see uh, a movement towards unfettered strategic competition with all of the risks that brings to bear, or we're going to see a recognition on the part of uh, the leaders in, in all three of these countries of the importance of finding a way to regulate their strategic relationships that reduces the risk of, of uh, conflict, that reduces the risk of arms competition. Um, and, and to my mind, uh, it is a, a dangerous point in time because it is, a, it is a turning point. And it brings to mind the famous, the famous AJP Taylor comment about Germany, which is that in 1848, Germany reached its turning point and failed to turn. It's a possibility that in the US-Russia relationship and the US-China relationship, we've reached a turning point and we will fail to turn. Um, but at the same time, I think there are reasons for optimism uh, and for hope. Because I'm always an optimist. Thank you, Lou. I think we certainly discovered that over the course of this dialogue. Um, Andre, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I would agree with what uh, Lou just said. And uh, you can imagine how uncertain, you know, spheres, certain countries will just decide that, yeah, we can tolerate this level of um, adverse, ad, adversary 
uh, we can tolerate this um, without dialogue, without arms control, just, you know, uh, competition and let's see how it goes. Uh, we've been through such times. Uh, they were not the best of times, but, you know, uh, we have precedents and we survived. Uh, probably with a lot of luck uh, going into as well. So one of the reasons maybe for optimism, and again, it's a, it's a cautious optimism, is that the system of uh, arms control that we got uh, was sort of, um, it wasn't created through some grand design. It was just going and created it a, a, as we went. So at first, you know, missile defense came up, then we sort of maybe we'll pause this offensive arms, then we uh, maybe we'll have some verification, then this INF issue came up and we regulated it. So then we created the system, but it was created uh, in a quite different environment and also without any uh, grand uh, plan in mind. And there is no reason why there are no weapons in space. It just so happened that nobody put weapons in space. Otherwise, everything could be much different now. So maybe, just maybe, if we are now starting to think about some kind of new arms control, maybe we could come up with a, some kind of design which would be reflecting all the moving parts and everything will be covered. There'll be no loopholes. Uh, at least there is a possibility now because as I said, we are almost at zero in terms of regulations. When you're almost at zero, you might come up with something better, but that's, yeah, that's a wildly optimistic <laughs> take. Uh, and there are other uh, options which are much less fun. Thank you, uh, Andre. Manpreet, do you share the same sense of cautious optimism, at least? Uh, you have to, you have to for. Yeah, I would like to, I would like to take that thing about cautious optimism, but I think I'm a little more pessimistic. So I would say we are at 100 seconds to midnight, uh, as the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, you know, the clock face tells us. Uh, we are seeing nuclear modernization, which is pretty much unfettered amongst the nuclear weapon states, complemented with a hyper-nationalism amongst the leaders uh, and uh, with no shared sense of nuclear risks. Uh, and that, I think, uh, puts us uh, in a place where inadvertent escalation. I'm not worried about deliberate nuclear use happening. I think deterrence uh, is fairly well understood amongst the nuclear dyads, but uh, inadvertent escalation happening because of this unique set of, you know, things that I've just mentioned uh, could bring us to the brink of a uh, of something like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, as Andre mentioned, you know, we went to the arms control architecture after going through the experience of coming to the brink, uh, and I am hope I'm hoping that before that, there will be a set of visionary leaders that will be able to arrest any such, you know, coming to the brink. Uh, and for this, uh, you know, organizations like us, groups like us have to, of course, keep bringing out uh, reports like this, but also bring out the horrors of nuclear use and the futility of the, the military futility of nuclear use. Uh, you know, uh, Wilfred, if I can, there was this question about chemical weapons falling into disuse. Uh, because nuclear weapons came along, that was in the chat box. And I wanted to just clarify that the chemical weapons were banned in 1925. The nuclear weapons came along in 1945. So it was not that the, you know, that the larger weapon came along and therefore the chemical weapon was banned. It was because there was no military utility seen of the chemical weapons that it was banned. And I'm hoping we'll reach that stage with nuclear weapons uh, to understand that nothing much, there's no political objective which is worth achieving with the use of nuclear weapons that will push us back from uh, you know, uh, wanting to retain them forever. Thank you, Manpre, for, for tackling that as well. Kareem, I'm going to give you the last word here today. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't think we should overlook the impact of all of this on the regime level, right? Because if it is the case that these uh, relationships of deterrence are under stress, the processes of arms control, uh, uh, strategic arms control are under stress and being challenged, then I think th those dynamics also have implications for the integrity uh, and the viability of the global regime. 
and again, in ways that uh, may be obvious, you know, the, the, in, in terms of Article 6 commitments by the nuclear weapon states, but then again, in ways that may not be obvious. So if, if we are at a turning point with respect to these uh, strategic relationships among nuclear weapon states and nuclear armed states, the hope is that we are not yet at a turning point with respect to the legitimacy of the regime. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to think how we can reinforce that legitimacy as we shore up these deterrent relationships and processes of strategic arms control and hopefully disarmament. Thank you so much. And on that note, I'd like to conclude by expressing our thanks to all of our panelists and speakers today. Um, thanks to the Unitir team that produced this event, particularly Maria Garzon Maceda and Eleanor Krabbel. Thanks to you, the audience, for joining us uh, for this event. Just a couple of announcements before we go. One is that you'll all receive a uh, email from the Unitir team requesting your feedback. Um, alternatively, you can actually complete this now through the instructions in the chat window, or you might be redirected in the form uh, directly after you close the Zoom window, so you won't be able to get away. But if I can encourage all of you to fill in this uh, feedback form, this helps us improve events moving forward. Second, I would really like to invite you to explore the publications of this nuclear dialogue series, including the findings publication we discussed today. And actually, to Kareem's last point, we have a new paper about confidence restoring measures to bridge uh, today's nuclear uh, divides that is released on the Unitera website uh, uh, as of today. And, and third and final, uh, please take note of the other side events to the first committee that are being convened by Unitera. In particular, the WMD program is organizing uh, next Monday an event on nuclear risk reduction friction points, and you'll get to hear from Unitera's new deputy director, Dr. Cecile Aptel. Um, and then on Tuesday, you'll have an event uh, with my colleague Pavel Podvik on exploring prospects for missile verification. You can find more information and in the link to register uh, on the, uh, in the link on the screen or in your chat box. Um, with that, thank you so much for joining us uh, and have a good day or evening wherever you might be. Take care.